Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael Aoun Veor. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of hundreds available as free downloads, podcasts, or transcriptions. Our lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures to find teachings that suit you. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live and includes a free online classroom allowing listeners to see images, read related scriptures, and ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate, visit GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is a service of Glorian Publishing, a non-profit organization. The lectures and radio broadcast have been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. To make a donation, visit GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In the previous two lectures, which were called The Elements in Spiritual Growth and Transmutation, we were talking about how spirituality is based on the transformation of energy. And one of the emphasized points of those lectures is that every given element, every given um, existing thing, is composed of three components. And energy is one of those components. The other two are matter and consciousness. So all things have this trinity, from the tiniest to the largest. So we ourselves are composed of these three components, energy, matter, and consciousness. And only by working with these three in conjunction with each other, can we fulfill the purpose of spirituality? So in those two lectures, we described for you five basic components of all manifested things. And those five components are sometimes called or simplified to just four elements. And we call them the four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. Those four elements in spirituality do not refer merely to physical elements. They refer to spiritual and psychological elements as well. And those elements also are composed of those three primary factors, matter, energy, and consciousness. But those four elements are ultimately only manifestations of one element. They are particularizations or condensations or crystallizations of a more primordial, more raw matter, energy, and consciousness. In Hinduism, that fundamental source is called prakriti, in Hebrew, we call it Shekinah. In English terms, we would call it Divine Mother. In Latin, it is Mater, M-A-T-E-R. And it's where we get the word matter. Mater, Mother. Which has in its construction the root term or uh, phrase, Ma which of course universally is the word for mother. These four elements, air, fire, water, and earth, are particularizations or condensations of the body of the mother nature, ma, 
mater, ama, mother, matter. These are all the same thing. Our physical body is a very gross level or dense level of the condensation of these four elements that emerged into existence because of a physical mother. But that ability for that physical body to exist, even though it's composed of these four elements and it came through a physical mother, is only possible because of a cosmic mother, our own individual inner mother. She who gave us these forces and energies to work with. That primordial source can also be called Kundalini in Sanskrit. But we have to understand the use of that word Kundalini. That in us, it is not active. It is latent. It is asleep. And this is why Kundalini is depicted in all the ancient religions as a sleeping serpent. A force that is not yet activated, not yet awakened, worked with. But it is the very power or energy of the Divine Mother. And this is why she's always represented with a serpent. My particular favorite representation of that force is the Divine Mother Athena or Minerva whose symbol is a serpent and she wears a serpent and she commands a serpent and oftentimes you'll see her with a serpent under her hand and that serpent represents the power of nature her power that in us is asleep not yet activated Unfortunately in us, that energy has been dispersed and misused and has elaborated what in Greek symbolism is represented as the opposite of Athena. And in Greek mysteries, that opposite is called Medusa. So you see that that word still begins with M. Ma. That Medusa is a woman who falls because of pride and vanity and lust. And that single serpent becomes many, becomes multiple. And it's symbolized as the serpents on her head. And her horrible power, which is to turn her victims into stone, into earth. In other words, the seductive power of the inverted power of the Divine Mother is to crystallize the ego. The power of Medusa is the same power of the Divine Mother, but inverted. And its power is to turn the heroes into stone, into earth, just like the wife of Lot in the Bible who looks back at the degeneration in her past and turns into a pillar of salt. Alchemically, it's the same symbol. Salt is a mineral, it belongs to earth. And that looking back to the past is desire. It is that obsession with the past that we all have. So the Divine Mother as the root energy who gives rise to those four elements can be called prakriti and another word for that energy is akash akash is the root vibration or prana the energy that vibrates in all things so it is in us it is the core or heart fire in every atom within us Physically and psychologically, we have that prana within. We have the power of the Divine Mother. The problem is that we have misused it and crystallized the ego. We've turned that power into something negative. 
And that power of Medusa is very strong in us. So that's why in these previous lectures we were describing how to transmute, how to reduce elements back to their essence and reform them into something pure. What this essentially means is that we take that very power of the Divine Mother and harness it. And we pulverize everything that's within us in order to reform it, to create something new, something pure, something better. In other words, we withdraw the energy from these four elements in order to bring them back to their original source, which is Akash. And in the tradition of alchemy, that original source is called quintessence, which means the fifth power. It is the fifth element. It is the Kundalini. It's the energy of the Divine Mother. In order to do that work, we need a laboratory. Without a laboratory, it's impossible to perform that type of work. We need a place within which we can bring the needed elements, focus them, pulverize them, purify them, extract the essence, cast aside what is unneeded and unnecessary, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat. So that those four elements, through the process of heat and pressure, gradually, with patience, become pure. This means that the power of the Divine Mother grows in us, awakens, emerges, and instead of being a latent or static power, becomes an active or kinetic power, something that moves, something that acts. This image, this circular illustration, represents for us the laboratory that we need. This illustration was designed by an alchemist Kabbalist from the 16th century, whose name is Heinrich Klinrath. He's a great alchemist and a great Kabbalist. A, what we call a Christian Kabbalist. He was a European, not a Jew, but a Christian who applied all the principles of Kabbalah and alchemy to his Christian faith. And he taught his principles through these types of drawings, which he commissioned artists to create. This is one of them. They are all beautiful. There are a series of these types of images. This one in particular is of great importance for our work because it represents in symbolic form the teachings that are only now being taught publicly in lectures like this. The teachings that he was working with and protected were completely secret. He utilized these images both to communicate to other initiates who were practicing the science and also to fish for students, to attract the souls who were prepared to work with the science, which were very few and even now are very few. But the science was not stated explicitly or given explicitly. It was given in symbolic form, which the trained could penetrate. Only those who were trained, only those who were given the keys, the clues, could understand the meanings hidden in these types of drawings. This drawing, of course, belongs to the Western tradition of alchemy. If you go to a university or a school where they study in a scholarly fashion our history, they will tell you all kinds of invented theories about alchemy. And it's all garbage. Because they are not initiated into the actual tradition of alchemy. So everything that the universities and books tell you about alchemy is theory. It's their ideas about it. It's what they think it is. But it is not what it is. Only the ones who've been initiated in the science, 
who have been brought into the actual tradition know what alchemy actually is. And there are many famous books and many famous websites and even movies that claim to teach alchemy and that talk about many beautiful and fantastic things, and they're all wrong. And their theories can be very beautiful and very compelling and move your heart, but be completely wrong. And this is because alchemy is a science to access the power of the Divine Mother herself. A divine power. It is not given to the profane. It is not given to those who simply are curious. Ever. Even now, in these times when the teachings are being openly revealed, the actual access to the power is still restrained. It is only given by one being, God. Only the divine bestows the power of alchemy on a person. No school, no book, no instructor bestows that. They may open doors, but to actually become an alchemist is a power given only by God. And it can only be that way. To understand that, we need to know what alchemy means. The real meaning, not the meaning that we see in movies and popular books, but the actual meaning. So to understand that, we will study this drawing. About alchemy, Samael Anvior said, we need to transmute the lead of personality into the gold of the spirit. This work is only possible in the laboratory of the alchemist. Probably the most famous statement that people make about alchemy is that it supposedly was a bunch of clowns running around Europe claiming to have the ability to transform crude metals into pure gold. And without question, there were many such clowns. People who dressed themselves up to look fantastic, to play the part of an alchemist, who were tricksters, who were only trying to get attention or money. Without a doubt, there are many such people even today. But this concept of transmuting lead into gold was merely a symbol of the actual work of alchemy, which is to transform the base metals, the earth, into pure metals. Symbolically speaking, that earth is us. In Kabbalah, the earth is represented by the Sefer Malkut, which represents you and me. But our metal, our earth, is very impure. It's very corrupted. It's very weak. It's susceptible to many illnesses and dangers. It is very impermanent and intransient. It is very unreliable. We don't know when we will die. We are very susceptible to illness, to weakness, to pain. We have no real power in the world. The tiniest thing can lay us flat. A microbe can make us sick and kill us. This does not equate strength. This is not a sign of strength or power in nature. It is a sign of weakness. To transmute the lead into gold refers to transforming the psyche, the mind, the heart, the personality, everything into spirituality, into gold, into a vessel through which the Divine Mother can operate without any obstacle. So Samael says this work is only possible in the laboratory. Naturally, over the centuries, those who've been curious about alchemy, who have wanted to make gold so they can become famous and rich, have made themselves many laboratories and have tried to reproduce the teachings of the alchemists physically by crafting all kinds of fantastic vessels and objects and ovens and limbics and many types of tools that they've gathered together. 
And as a result, we have now our modern science of chemistry. What we have now today as chemistry came from alchemy. You see the words the same? But the difference between chemistry and alchemy is that chemistry has lost the first two letters. Al. If you know Arabic, you know what that means. If you know Hebrew, you know what it means. El. El means God. El. Kimia. That word means to fuse with God. To bind. To merge. To become one. Chemistry renounces divinity. So modern chemistry has created some useful things. We don't deny it. But no chemist is an alchemist. We see here in these images the typical representations of alchemist laboratories that have been mimicked and celebrated for many centuries in the West as many foolish, greedy people have tried and wasted their lives attempting to create gold from lead, studying ancient texts, pouring their fortunes into futile pursuits. What we need as a laboratory is not this type of laboratory. The type of laboratory we need is revealed in this next image. This painting is also a painting from alchemy. And it represents the great contradiction or the great difference between those who are initiated into actual alchemy and those who are not. This image shows an alchemist in the center in his robe who is observing an angel, a woman. She is seated in a very strange looking tree and behind the alchemist is a building and inside the building we see one of those alchemists laboratories filled with all kinds of strange vessels and, a, and an oven. This image shows the difference between the materialists, the curious, the skeptics, the chemists who play with physical matter as they pursue their greed, as they pursue their lusts and envy, as they pursue their pride, attempting to play games with the matter of nature, the energy of nature while ignoring its consciousness. That's represented in that mechanical laboratory in the back. And that's why at the bottom of it, it says Opus Mechanicus. The mechanical work, the physical work, the literal work, the useless work. On the left, we see this woman, this angel, a cherubim, who has on her head a seven-pointed crown and she has under her hips a fire. That is the fire of the Divine Mother Nature. That is prana, akash, kundalini. She represents nature, who here is revealed to the eyes of the alchemist, who looks her directly in the face and knows who she is and bows his head. But you see that his hands are hidden from view. That's because the work that he's performing is not visible to the uninitiated. His right hand is hidden. His left hand is hidden and closed in black. This work of alchemy has always been done in darkness, hidden from the eyes of those who are uninitiated in it in order to protect it and in order to protect the uninitiated. Because those who play games with this type of teaching can cause great harm if they're not properly prepared. This tree that she sits in, of course, represents the Kabbalah, the structure of nature, the tree of life. And as one works with nature, 
that is precisely what is elaborated and perfected, our own inner tree of life. And you see that the tree itself has three roots, the trinity, which are united in one as a fire. That fire being kundalini is the fire that gives the power to create life. Naturally, it is a sexual power. So this image is showing us that we need proper instruction and we need to understand that the work is in our relationship with our Divine Mother. Nowhere else. This image is from an ancient book called Mutus Liber, which is a, means the mute book or silent book, which illustrates the principles of alchemy. I show that as a typical representation of how alchemy has been represented as a couple, man and woman, working with different devices in the process of purifying, heating, breaking down, purifying, heating things up, breaking them down, purifying them, constantly working until new things emerge, many symbolic forms that are hard to understand, that are very dreamlike. And here we see the meaning of alchemy. I told you already that al, or el, means God. And chemia comes from Greek, which means to fuse or cast a metal. So alchemy means to fuse with God, to make our metal, our body, our heart, our mind, one with the divine. This is the real meaning of alchemy. And what about the laboratory? Of course, nowadays we take this concept of a laboratory for granted. And we immediately think of people running around in white coats that wear glasses and usually have a pen in their pocket or a bunch of pens in their pockets. And we think they're very smart. Nowadays, we treat them like priests, like somehow they're better than us, more holy, they know more than us. But really, the whole concept of science and the laboratory came from this tradition of alchemy. In fact, all of the historical scientists were all alchemists. Newton, Galileo, even Einstein. They knew alchemy. So this word laboratory actually means something different from what we think it means. It comes from Latin. The first part, labor, of course we use that now to mean work, and that's what it means. Labor, laborum, means to exert its hardship, pain, fatigue, a work of labor, something difficult, something that is not easy. Without question, that applies to the Gnostic work. It is a very tiring work. It is a very exhausting work. It requires great exertion, toil. It engages much hardship and causes much pain. It is not pleasant, but it's worth it. So laboratory comes from laboratorium. The first part is labor, but the second part is oratorium, which means a place of prayer. So you see, a real laboratory is a place of prayer. So the alchemist's laboratory is a place of prayer. And without prayer, there can be no alchemy. This image also shows a similar one to what I showed you earlier. In this case, the alchemist is seeing the woman. This woman represents nature. She's removing her mask, meaning that he's seeing her true face. The veil of Isis is being lifted. Remember, Isis states, no mortal can see past my veil. Which means that in order to see the face of Isis, you have to become more than mere mortal. So here we see this image of the alchemist laboratory. As I told you, this was drawn by an artist for Heinrich Kunrath. He didn't draw it himself. He commissioned an artist to do it for him. So he gave the instructions to the artist who drew this uh, based on those instructions. It's filled with cryptic messages. 
And we don't have time in the context of a lecture to explain all of them. But I want to point out some of the important ones because they help us understand the teaching that we're studying now. In general, we see in this image an alchemist on his knees with his hands out praying before a tent. And the tent is very much like the tents used by the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. This is a symbolic representation of that sort of tent. Inside the tent, we see a table, and on it are many sacred books. But of great significance here is the posture of the alchemist. Nothing in this image is accidental. It is all purposeful. The alchemist is on his knees. This is a sign of humility. It is a sign of obedience. It is a representation that in order to engage in the real work of alchemy, we have to bow before the will of God. Not acting from our own will, but doing what is required of us by God. And his hands out form a crucifix. This is a cr complete relinquishment of personal will. This is the full and complete sacrifice of oneself on the cross. This is to be crucified on behalf of others. This is to die in order to serve. So the alchemist here is representing that this is the basis of the work. It is prayer, obedience, devotion. So on that side of the image, it's the left side, this is the prayer, prayerful aspect, the emotional aspect of the work. On the right-hand side, we see the logical aspect. We see all the tools that are arranged in the laboratory. And in the middle, we see a table that is also with many instruments, especially musical instruments, but also many other objects that are arranged there. Of particular significance here is that the entire image is topped by a seven-pointed lantern. It is a candelabra with seven flames. And those seven flames hang from a trinity so there you see the tree of life, the law of three and the law of seven. We see how those are the forces at work that we need to harness, the three and the seven. We need to light those fires in our own inner heavens in order to succeed in this work of alchemy. So a little more detail. On the left-hand side, we see this alchemist at prayer, kneeling on his cushion. At the very top of that tent, we see a cross. And the cross always represents the four elements in activity. The cross represents the crossing of man and woman. The vertical pole represents the active principle, the male. The horizontal pole represents the passive principle, or receptive principle, the woman. These are also the four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. Those are always engaged in any practice of alchemy. Moreover, they are the pinnacle. They are the most sacred. And they must be held very high. Below that it says oratorium, which as we told you means a place of prayer. Below that, it says, happy is he who follows the counsel of yod he Of course, it says that in Latin and Hebrew, but that's the translation. Happy is the one who follows the counsel of yod he -he. That yod he -he, or yod hav is our own inner guide, our own inner divinity. The four forces of the Tetragrammaton that work in us. 
That is our master. No one else. No one outside. Anywhere. Should be our counsel. Our counsel should be God. Our guide should be accessed through prayer, not the internet, not email, not the phone, not over coffee, not in groups or churches or temples, not at retreats or conferences, through prayer. This is the message at the pinnacle here below the cross. We must follow the guidance of our inner master. And to do that, we need to pray. We need to pray constantly. And under that, in Hebrew, it says here, Ha Kamael, which means the longing for God. That should be our motivation, our guide, is that longing. Not the longing for fame, recognition, security, comfort, the longing for God at any price, at any cost. We can stand any suffering if we hold fast to that longing for God. If we remember our being constantly focusing our attention on that divinity, we can withstand anything. The problem is we forget. We become distracted by our desires, by the eight worldly poisons, name and fame, gain, all the things that we long for and desire, the comfort, the security, the recognition, the revenge, the redemption. That's why we suffer. If we really hold fast to our prayer, to the remembrance of divinity, to that devotion, we have a place of solitude, of solace, which is here, this area of prayer. Burning inside of this tent is a single flame. And that flame is the flame of the heart. The flame of our own heart. We all want that flame to be enlivened through romance through the love of our friends or our children. We want the respect of our peers. But all of those are mistaken. Those types of flames in the heart are completely impermanent and unreliable. They do not last. They cannot last. The only flame that can burn in your heart that can last and that can actually give solace to the consciousness is the love of divinity. A reciprocal love. That love is always coming towards us, but because we don't pay attention, we don't feel it. If we learn to pay attention, to listen into the heart, to sense divinity in our presence, that becomes a real living thing, a fire, a flame that you can feel, that can sustain you. But it requires exertion on your part to reach out, to feel it. The alchemist kneels before a table. That table represents the four bodies of sin. Physical body, vital body, astral body, mental body. We call them the four bodies of sin because it's through these vessels that we commit our mistakes and we create suffering for ourselves and others. The physical body, obviously, is the vessel through which we transmit all our energy. We transmute it improperly. The vital body is the vessel through which that energy goes in and out of our psyche. The astral body relates to our emotions Unfortunately in us, it has become kama rupa, a body of desire. And the mental body relates to our, our uh, Judas inside, our betrayer, the liar, the mind, the pilot, 
Pontius Pilate that we have. That part of us that refuses to accept any responsibility for our crimes and that always sees ourselves as innocent. Just a victim of circumstances. We're not really at fault. That's what we tell ourselves. Those four bodies have to be transformed, transmuted, in order to become a proper table of prayer so that that table of four legs becomes the solar bodies. That transmutation is what creates the alchemist table. And that's the table upon which the real alchemist can work. The real alchemist is our inner being. The real alchemist is God. The one who really performs the work of alchemy is the innermost, the magician, the first card of the tarot. And if you study that card, you see he stands before a table, and that table represents us. But in us, that table is unsteady, impure, weak. It needs to be transformed and made strong. That's why underneath the table in this drawing, we see an arch, and inside that arch is a skull. It's in darkness. And they're written in Latin. It's really hard to read on this screen. It says, Dice bene mori. If you know Italian, you know what that means. It means learn to die well. Learn to die well. This is not talking about physical death. It's talking about psychological death. The death of those four bodies of sin so that they can be recreated, made into something pure, something strong that the being can use for his work. Learn to die well. The pose of the alchemist here represents the same thing, and that's why they're closely together here. His crucifixion, his obedience, his humility, his prayer, all represents the attitude that we need in order to die well. That is an attitude of submission. We don't like that. Our pride does not like that. We don't want to submit. We want God to submit to us. And that's why when we pray, we say, God, give me this and give me that. God, I want this and that. I'll make a deal with you, God. If you give me A, B, and C, then I'll do this little thing over here for you. I'll do this little favor for you if you give me A, B, and C. We want God to submit to us. This is why we can't feel God. This is why we hear a silence when we pray. Because God will never bow to the ego. This is not a matter of pride. It's a matter of how things work. The ego is the devil. Our mind is Satan. The alchemist here shows the proper attitude for prayer. It is submission to God's will. And this is why Jesus taught his prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That earth is the body. That earth is Malkut. That earth is us. There are many other symbols written here, but we don't have really time to go into all of them. But that's the essence of what's being taught in these symbols. On the right side of the drawing, we see two pillars. And behind that, in obscurity, is a collection of tools. These two pillars have great significance in all ancient esoteric traditions. In the Bible, they are called Jaquin and Boaz. Anyone who has been a Freemason knows about these two pillars. The two pillars represent 
the two sides of the tree of life, the pillar of severity and the pillar of mercy. These are the two sides of the tree of knowledge, Tob and Ra. These are man and woman, the two sides of all creation. You cannot create with just a man and you cannot create with just a woman. Life emerges when you combine man and woman. Thus, all life is founded on two pillars. All life. So behind the two pillars, we see this area of tools and hidden in the back here is an oven. And there is incense burning. And there are little tools scattered around. There's a lute, there's a bellows, there's tongs. These are all tools for working in the fire. There's a feather hanging on a pillar. All of these are symbolic. What's particularly interesting are the inscriptions at the base of the two pillars. The one on the left says ratio, which is a Latin word. We use the word ratio in English now for a particular meaning. But in Latin, ratio means reason. And not like in the sense of, oh, I have a reason for doing that. It doesn't mean that. It means reason in the sense of logic and method. If you think of it in terms of method, it becomes very interesting when you look at the other pillar, which in Latin says experientia. And naturally in English, we would say it means experience. Yes, it does but not the way we use it now. Experientia means wisdom. These two pillars, method and wisdom, anybody recognize that? Any Buddhists here? Those are the two pillars of Buddhism, method and wisdom. If you ever see an image of Samantabhadra or any great Buddha, you always see them in a sexual embrace masculine and feminine. And if you ask any monk, what does that mean? They say it is the union of method and wisdom, which is how the Dharma is performed. Method and wisdom in combination. We see the same image here from alchemy. The two pillars, method and wisdom. What does that mean? It means we need a combination in order to build our temple we need theory and practice. We need a strong intellectual culture. We need to know the teaching very well, but we also need to be doing it. And these two need to be in perfect harmony, perfect balance with each other. There are many people who read a lot of books, study a lot of theory, study all the method, but don't do it. And there are many others who do a lot of practices and a lot of techniques, but never study. Both camps of people will fail. The path of alchemy is extremely precise. More than anything else in the world. It is extremely precise. Our understanding has to be razor sharp. And guided by divinity. Not our intellect. Not our habits. You see, those who lean towards the method side like to pick up different practices that appeal to their habits. And those who lean towards the wisdom side, or the, yeah, the wisdom side, the experiential side, like to read and study those things that feed their habits, that lean towards their habits. So the intellectual types like to read and study a lot of intellectual things, but they don't like to practice. And the believers like to study a lot to build up their beliefs and make them feel secure, but they don't like to practice. And they don't like to study and remember things because we're all lazy. We need balance. And we need to be very critical with ourselves. And if we see that we're lazy about practice, we need to practice more. And if we see that we're lazy about study, we need to study more. 
This is not a game. The future of your soul depends on it. Everything is at stake. And laziness will take you to hell. Period. Laziness and old bad habits will cause you to fail. Period. So these two pillars are very important. Before them, in the front of them, at the very front of the image, we see an alchemist's collection of tools. We can call it an oven, a furnace. We see here some different vessels that are connected together in a strange way. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And written in the center vessel, which is quite tall and very phallic, we see written festina lente. This is Latin, of course, and it means hasten slowly. Hasten slowly. That means move quickly, slowly. Kind of makes your brain skip, doesn't it? It's supposed to. It's supposed to get you to pay attention, to be present, to be here and now. It's written on a phallic symbol, a sexual symbol, for a reason. It's saying, pay attention, be present, use your energy wisely, don't waste it. Be persistent, work constantly, but don't rush. Work with great caution and care. So this symbol at the bottom is representing the mysterious tools of the alchemist, the tools that were never revealed publicly, but which today we're going to talk about. Uh, again, there are many other symbols here that we just don't have time to get into details. So returning once again to the overall view, we see that this image hides a great secret. But it's very hard to penetrate it. Partly because the screen is not very sharp. I apologize. You can't see the thing I'm pointing at and want you to see most specifically. But this is a very purposeful drawing. And I'm going to show you why right now. If you study art, you'll understand that the genuine artist does every little detail with a purpose. Not like art nowadays, where basically they're vomiting on canvas and just making whatever and calling it whatever they want to call it. That's not art. Real art is a communication, conscious, that communicates knowledge that otherwise is incommunicable. This drawing is a great example of that. There are many messages here that you will gather if you meditate on the image. But I'm going to give you a hint towards one that has real significance and that's quite surprising. If you study the image, you see that there are many lines. It's a very architectural type of image, right? And all of the lines are converging on a single point. We call this perspective. And we don't pay attention to that. We don't really think anything of it. But if you look closely, you see all the lines, the perspective is going to the very center of the image. And it's passing through an arch of four pillars. Those four pillars are the four elements, the four bodies, the cross, the four letters of the holy name of God. That four has a great deal of significance. The arch above it is the akash, which comes from this trinity at the top. Here we see the tree of life and that architectural structure. But what do all the lines ultimately point towards? A door, an open door. And what's behind the open door? 
a bed. A bed. Why would an alchemist drawing have all of the lines and everything in the image converging on a bed? Well, nowadays we know why. But for the last 500 years, no one knew why. The bed is where the sexual act is performed. This is the heart of the laboratorium where the work and prayer must be performed on the bed. Laboratorium, the place of prayer where the work is performed is in the bedroom. That work is, of course, a work between man and woman. And if one is single, one works within oneself with one's own energy and, of course, with one's Divine Mother through prayer. These images represent that furnace or oven that the alchemist has to work with. This is really the heart of the alchemist's laboratory. The furnace, the athenor. These are three different images. The one in the top right, of course, is from the image we've been looking at. And these are two other typical examples from the alchemical tradition that show the alchemist's furnace. Again, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have been trying to build these in their garages and basements. They're wasting their time. You know why? Because every one of us is carrying this around with us all the time. This furnace is your body. The laboratory is your mind, your heart, your body. The laboratory of the alchemist is this being here now, working with your energy here and now. That is the laboratory. The furnace, the tools are here in the body. The fire burns in sex. In Yasod is the fire that creates life, the sexual energy, the fire that burns us if we don't know how to control it, the fire that can destroy us and consume us if we don't know how to use it wisely. That fire must be kept with a gentle heat with much attention. This is the instruction that Hermes gave in the documents that formed the foundation of alchemy. That gentle heat is to keep that fire burning, but low, controlled, not inflamed with lust, not with, inflamed with desire, not overwhelming, but low and controlled with much attention. And in that context, that fire heats the vessel, the sexual organs. Here we see that vessel represented as a clear glass vessel. Within it burns the fire, or the water actually, of mercury. Mercury is a symbol for sexual energy. And inside of this, we see a man and a woman forming a cross, and the Holy Spirit as a dove putting the other element, which forms a six-pointed star. That, of course, is a very deep, significant symbol. It is the rune Hagal. This man and woman represent Adam and Eve in us, psychologically, physiologically. Ida and Pingala, Od and Obd, energies, forces that are within us. The red and the white channels of Tantra, Rasana and Lalana. These are energies or forces that move in us in preparation for the advent of the fire or the awakening of the Kundalini. The fire of sexuality heats the waters of the mercury and causes steam to rise up the central column of the spine to the brain. And that's what's represented in all these images. The awakening of the Kundalini, the energy of the Divine Mother. That energy rises up the spine and awakens the seven lights on that candelabra of seven flames. 
Those seven lights are the chakras or churches written about in the book of Revelation. Those lights give us the ability to see spiritually. They restore us to the state of Eden to have the ability to talk with God directly. That does not come when we are seeking only material gold or material success. That ability to see God and talk with God comes through prayer. On either side of this oven, we see a man and woman with deep red faces wearing green clothing. These represent the forces of divinity. We can call them Shiva and Shakti. These are our inner being and our divine mother. They are the guides who oversee the process of transmutation in us. In other words, no matter what fantastical ends you may pursue in your physical life to achieve the goals of alchemy, if you do not work in harmony with your innermost, you will achieve nothing. The one who performs the work in you is your inner divinity. And that work is performed by satisfying the will of God. And the first will of God is for you to die as an ego, for all of your impurity to be purged. That's what the fire does. This fire boils the water to remove the impurities. The steam rises, not the impurities. The steam. What is steam? Water and air that is heated by fire. And it rises up through the earth to awaken and enliven the brain, Adam, the glands, the chakras in the head. So that is, in synthesis, the process of alchemy. The work in the laboratory. It is to work with these forces in ourselves, in harmony with the will of God. So let me read a quote from Samael about this, because this um, process is something that you are engaging in now. If you're transmuting your sexual energy, if you're studying these teachings and trying to put them into practice, you are learning to practice alchemy, whether you're single or married. That's just circumstantial. That's the nature of your karma. That's what you need to work with. That is what God is giving you to work with. So work with it. Either way, what God does, your innermost and your divine mother, is they bring into the laboratory the elements that need to be transformed. And then there we are in the laboratory saying, no, 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 God. No, I don't want to work with that. Nope. That's not the spouse I want. That's not the job I want. I need more money than this. I need better clothes. I need to be living somewhere better than this. I need some respect from my friends. I need a little education. I need some money in the bank. I don't want these things you're bringing into my life. I want A, B, and C. Then I'll do what you want after that. Big mistake. Who better in the universe knows what you need for your spiritual growth than your own God? Who knows better? So it's time for us to trust God to submit to the will of God, to accept what God puts in our lives, and to learn to transmute them. This is the basis of alchemy. Oftentimes we talk about alchemy as something materialistic. We just take the sexual energy, we transform it, and we awaken consciousness. It's not that simple. You can't get anywhere with just that attitude. The real process of alchemy is to transmute your entire psyche 
And where is all your sexual energy anyway? It's trapped in your ego. It's all trapped in lust and pride and anger and envy. So to free it, to redeem it, to free yourself from suffering, you have to transform those elements. And how will God do it? He will put it in your face. By making you suffer. To say, see, here is the bed of roses that you made. It's filled with thorns. The life that you're living is the life that you made by your own works. If you want to make that better, accept the guidance of God. The counsel of God. That counsel is, you want to do the work? You want to be an alchemist? You want to be liberated from suffering? Here, deal with this mess that you made. Here is your life. Here is your circumstances. Here is your situation. You made it. Fix it. And we don't fix it by changing everything in our external circumstances. We fix it by changing our attitude. Changing how we deal with other people. How we deal with God. How we deal with ourselves. Those who are focused only on changing their physical circumstances will always end up disappointed. We can never modify external circumstances to our liking because the cause of them is inside of us. If the cause remains the same, the effects will remain the same. Why do we suffer? Because of who we are inside. So God's bringing us our situation as painful or difficult as it may be, because we need it. Because that's what we need to work on. That is the most important element that we face. We always hear students pray, God, please give me what I need to work on myself. But change this and that. Give me a better job. Give me a better place to live. I need a nicer apartment, etc., etc. We don't realize that what God is giving us is exactly what we need. In the book Turan Kala, Samuel M. Vior wrote, The salamanders keep the fire. The undines are within the raw matter, which is enclosed within its receptacle. The undines can help us if we dominate them. If we do not, then they do what they want because they are very whimsical. The sylphs make the steam that escapes from the raw matter to rise. The gnomes are in charge of the distillation of the raw matter in order for it to be converted into gold within the brain. That quote is describing how the four elements in ourselves are managed by consciousness, conscious elements that we call elementals. The process of alchemy is a process of working with the elements. Those elements are not just physical matter. They are energy. They are also consciousness. The fire, the air, the water, and the earth all have consciousness in them. And traditionally, in alchemy, they have these names. The elements of the air were called sylphs. The elements of the fire are called salamanders, or the consciousness of the fire. The consciousness of the water are called undines. And the consciousness of the earth, gnomes, dwarves, pygmies. These are not invented or made up things. They are the consciousness of the elements. They are inside of us. Moreover, as we explained in the first lecture, all of the ordeals that we face in life, the difficulties, the problems, ordeals of air, ordeals of water, of earth, of fire, are the activity of those elementals in our life. When we're facing difficult psychological challenges, our old habit is to complain and complain and complain in our mind, in our heart, and verbally. What we are failing to realize is that those problems are exactly what we need 
Those problems are the activity of those elementals in us and around us that are bringing up a great deal of energy that if we are smart, we will harness that and transmute it into something beneficial. I'll give you an example. If you're in a circumstance where you are having to be very close with someone who is constantly criticizing you behind your back, it can be very frustrating. And it can build a lot of resentment in you unless you learn to transform it. What would be the right way to transform that? Firstly, you can only transform it if you are cognizant of it, if you're aware of it. If you're just being mechanical the way you always are, you'll just build a lot of resentment. You'll become angry with the person. You'll start treating them badly. You'll ignore them. You'll intentionally do things to create obstacles for them. You'll speak badly against them. You'll do all those things mechanically because we're asleep. But if you become cognizant, aware, and pray and remember God, and then you say, okay, God's giving me this for a reason. This person's talking bad about me all the time. To my face, they're nice. But behind my back, they're telling everybody all these bad things about me. What do I do, God? Help me. Learn. Help me learn to die well. Then what do we do? We have to learn to treat that person with love. Because they're helping us. They're showing us our pride. We don't like to see that. And we don't like the one who makes us see it. But really, we need that. That person is actually the most important person in our life at that moment. They are doing for us a service that can never be repaid because they are giving us the keys to liberation from suffering. They are saying, here is your pride. Here is your anger. Here is your resentment. If we act mechanically, we will indulge in the pride and the anger and the resentment. We will hate that person and we will deepen our suffering and waste the opportunity. If we're cognizant, prayerful, learning to die well, then we can see this person and say, they are really doing me a favor. Look at my pride. Let me feel that. Let me see it. Let this be the last time that I suffer with this pride. Let it die. And we respond to that person with kindness, with gratitude, with love. What will happen to that situation? It will be transformed. Completely. And this is the type of attitude we need to generate in all of our circumstances. This is how we take advantage of the energies that the elementals are putting into motion. The being is orchestrating all the circumstances of our life in order to put these things in our face. And he's doing that with the help of the elementals, both inside of us and around us. So we need to learn to transform that energy to have a better attitude. To learn to accept with gratitude all the unpleasant manifestations of life and of our fellow men and women. To receive them gratefully because they are the keys to awakening. The problems of our lives, the adversities, the obstacles, the pain, the suffering, are exactly what we need in order to see why we suffer and to change. If God gave you what you wanted, a totally peaceful life, rich, living in your castle with all your servants, whatever it is that you dream of, not only would you not become liberated from suffering, you would become worse. Really contemplate that. Really think about that. When those desires are emerging in you, really think about it. If I really got that, really, honestly, 
Would I become better? No. If you won the lottery, would you really become better? I don't think so. I really doubt it about myself. You have to be your own judge. Any questions? In this picture here with the green and red spaces, uh, why is the female, she has like a masculine leg and, and he looks like he's got a feminine foot maybe? The leg is very... That's probably just the skill of the artist, you know? Her leg is being revealed because she is the Divine Mother Nature. So as the work of alchemy is proceeding, the identity or reality of the Divine Mother is revealed. And it's something intimate. So that leg being exposed is that. It's something intimate. Yes? The there's a, the process of alchemy is broken down into many different stages by different alchemists. And there are a variety of terms that are used to describe those stages. And it depends on which alchemist you're studying and which stage of the work they're addressing, how to interpret those symbols. Uh, sometimes the steps are broken down as 7, 10, 12, 14, many stages. And they all apply to different parts of the work. In general, though, we talk about a process called putrefaction or blackening. And this is a process in which through the heat of the fire, the ego becomes blackened. It becomes, de uh, what do you call it? The fire accelerates the decomposition. So when we look at the context of our ordeals in life, before you were transmuting your energy, you suffered a lot. We all suffer. And we suffer from many um, psychological and circumstantial problems. But when you begin to transmute your sexual energy, your suffering seems to intensify. And that is the process of the blackening or putrefaction. That's because the sexual energy, when it's being harnessed and directed by the Divine Mother towards the ego, it intensifies everything about the experience of that ego. So the suffering seems to get worse. Because it is. But that's needed. In order for those elements to be completely eradicated, broken down, and the purity to be released, we need that. We need the pressure and heat to crush it so we can extract the diamonds, the gold. So again, it depends on which particular alchemist and which stage, because that comes in many stages. There are stages in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. Many stages of that. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that in additional lectures, specifically about that. The process of the work in the laboratory is a gathering together of energy in order to direct that energy. And our primary purpose in the beginning is to completely pulverize all the impure elements that exist inside of our psyche. The only way that process can succeed is if we're cognizant of it. In other words, you can't change your anger if you're unaware of your anger. You can't change your pride if you're unaware of your pride. So that process of becoming cognizant begins in your daily life through self-observation, self-remembering, being aware of oneself and transforming situations in the way that I explained. But secondly, you can't succeed in that completely if you're only doing it during the day. At night, you need to meditate on those events and really investigate them more deeply, abandoning the physical body so that you're not distracted by any physical senses and you can go deeper into the examination of those elements in order to pulverize them more accurately and to completely, completely reduce it 
to dust. So that's a process of meditation. And that's a long process. Uh, but we'll get more into the details of it as we go along. Another question? Yeah, just on the, on the image, the first one, the Kunrat image. Mm -hmm. uh, above in the bedroom, um, what does it say in Latin? It's uh, a good question. I meant to mention it and I forgot. Above the bedroom, on that structure, we see lit written in Latin, dormiens vigila, which means while sleeping, watch. Interesting phrase, isn't it? Sort of like hasten slowly. Dormiens vigila means that we need to be vigilant at all times, conscious of ourselves. Now, on the first level, on the easy to grasp level here, it's saying that we need to do this while the physical body is sleeping. That's one level of meaning of the bed in the back. And some people who've studied this image have realized that, that it relates to the tradition of dream yoga. This is easy to see. But the deeper meaning is that we're always sleeping because our consciousness is asleep. We have not awakened our consciousness yet. So we need to become vigilant. That vigilance is not at one time or another. It is all the time. Dormians vigila means watch how you sleep. Become aware of how you sleep. Awaken. And that's what it says in the Gospels. Watch. Because we know not at what hour the master will arrive. Any questions back here? Yeah. How do the runes fit in with alchemy? How do the runes fit in with alchemy? Everything about alchemy is based on the runes. Absolutely everything. If you've studied any of the symbols of alchemy, you see that all of the symbols are runic. And I gave you a clue here. When you look into the vessel here that shows the, the man, the woman, and the Holy Spirit, the bird, between them all, they are upholding the rune Hagal, which we talked about in the previous lecture. Every alchemical symbol, every alchemical stage is based in the runes. All of it. It's very deep. Any other questions back here? Is this process the process of Moses, Moses leading the Israelites to Jerusalem? The process of alchemy is hidden throughout the Bible. Moses is an alchemical symbol. His name means Moshe, which means born of water and fire. And that's what we see here. The fire is below. The water is in the vessel. And the one who is born of that is our divinity, our own inner Moshe. So the entire process, every stage of the work of Moses or Moshe is a symbol in alchemy. All of the plagues, all of the works that he performed, all of the magical events that happened, the parting of the waters, the coming of the frogs, all of those things represent stages of work in alchemy. More questions? Any more questions here? Is alchemy something for beginners? And if so, what is the first stage? Truthfully speaking, alchemy is for all human beings. All of us need alchemy. In order to become a true human being, we need it. And we are all beginners, without exception. The thing that we need in the beginning is to study. We need to study the teaching. We need to study it very well. Without a strong foundation in understanding the teaching in a very comprehensive way, we will very easily be misled by, by very clever people and very mischievous people. So it is essential 
in the beginning to study relentlessly and at the same time to begin to incorporate practice at your own level. So we can say in some way that in the beginning, those two pillars are a little bit out of balance. We don't know how to practice in the beginning. We don't know the method. We don't even know the teaching. So in the beginning, we have to first start by learning the method, learning the teaching itself, learning how it works, learning the theory, learning the concepts, learning the words, the language, how it works. Little by little, we need to add practice as well so that they start to nourish each other. This is very important to begin to establish that equilibrium between the two. Part of that is to learn to recognize the realities about yourself, to be sincere, to be honest with yourself. This type of work is not social at all. Unfortunately, many people make it into something social. They want their spirituality to be a social group. And there is a need for the Sangha or the spiritual community. We need that. It's one of the three fundamental jewels or aspects of any real spirituality are the, the three jewels. The community is part of that. But ultimately, the real community is not in the physical world. The real community or Sangha is in the internal world. We don't need to be too worried about the physical part. We shouldn't be focused on the social aspects of our spirituality. We should be focused on the psychological aspects in ourselves. Be honest. Be sincere. Look at yourself and see what you really are and don't hide from yourself. It is painful. It is very painful. Don't avoid it. If you avoid something painful, you let it get worse and it will kill you. And the same is true spiritually, especially spiritually. If you avoid looking into your psychological and spiritual pain, you will never succeed in this work. That's why the phrase on that drawing says, learn to die well. We need to look into the face of those things that hurt us so that they won't hurt us anymore. It's not an easy thing to do, but it must be done. Question here. Where do we find Lucifer related in laboratory? Lucifer in the laboratory? Lucifer is everything in the laboratory. He's the laboratory itself. Lucifer, properly translated, of course, is a Latin phrase, and it means the carrier of light. Luce fer. So Lucifer is the one who makes it possible for this work to occur. Lucifer, in other words, is the heat of the fire. Lucifer is the boiling of the water. Lucifer is the rising of the steam. Um, my question is, like, where do we find the aspect of him as a, as the tasker, the one tasking us to that world? Well, when you look into the symbolism of alchemy, we see always that the stages related to the disintegration of the ego are a process of putrefaction or degeneration, decay. So we see many images of corpses and of uh, a black raven uh, and of animals eating corpses, things like that. Lucifer is that process. Properly said, Lucifer is the one who orchestrates the ordeals around us so that we see ourselves for what we are. So in the earlier part of the lecture, when I was saying your being is the one who's giving you your ordeals, that is Lucifer. It is that aspect of the being. We nowadays, unfortunately, think Lucifer is evil, is Satan. But this is inaccurate. That was a misinterpretation that was uh, made by the Catholic Church centuries ago that they never corrected. And it's, it's easy to see that in ancient times, even the bishops were named Lucifer. So it was not always a negative name. They made it into something negative because of a political squabble that happened a long time back when uh, Jerome was fighting with another bishop whose name was Lucifer. So he changed in the Bible, O oh, thou Lucifer, how thou art fallen, because he was talking about that bishop that he didn't like. 
But ever since then, we've been hearing, oh, Lucifer's Satan. It's not true. Lucifer is an aspect of Christ. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Which alchemical book is the best? Hmm. Well, honestly, the best alchemical book is yourself. Everything you need to know about alchemy is in your psychological makeup. But you can't learn about that unless you have guidance and instruction. The best places you will find that are the book of Genesis and the Bible, but not in English, in Hebrew. The second place is the book of Revelation in the Bible, but not in English, in Greek. And the other places that you will find it are in all the books of Tantra. Tantra is just another name for alchemy. It's the same tradition. In fact, if you investigate the secret writings of the great tantric masters, you'll find they use the same terminology. Tsongkhapa, who was one of the great Buddhist masters, spoke often of the foundation stone and transmutation. Same terms as the alchemists. And the philosopher's stone, he used that term also. So these are all unified really as one tradition, but physically we don't see that. The other important book in the tradition of alchemy is the Emerald Tablet, which was presented to humanity by Hermes, the god Thoth from Egypt. So those are the most important treatises of alchemy. Below that, there are hundreds, and they're all interesting. But let me point out something important. The truth about alchemy, you will not find it in the past. The past is dead. The past is gone. The past is a rotting corpse. Don't waste your time. The truth of alchemy you're going to find here and now in your heart. By prayer to God. In your life. By practicing. That's where you'll find it. The texts are interesting. We need to study the teaching. And we need to understand the principles. But don't be distracted, longing for the past, or trying to uncover secrets from the past, because you will not. Everything from the past was hidden and is already dead. Why dig up an old corpse just to pick through the bones when the living truth of alchemy is burning inside of you now? It is the fire of your Divine Mother who's waiting to awaken if you have the courage to do it. And that is the courage to face yourself as you are and to change. To take your energy and use it better. To awaken. To transmute yourself. Then you will find the reality of alchemy. You won't need all those old books. You won't need dusty papers and stale concepts and to memorize old terms and theories and images because you'll see that it's all just dust. The living, vibrating reality of alchemy is waiting for you inside of your heart right now. But you have to have the courage to look and to use it. Any other question? Okay, thank you. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.